If you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we continue to unravel the mysteries behind the origins, motives, and cultures of the 13 vampiric clans in the world of darkness. This episode will focus on the clans of death, Clan Giovanni, and Clan Cappadocian. I don't believe there is a clan more bold, desperate, depraved, and shameful than the members of Clan Giovanni. They are incestuous, necrophilic diabolists that go hand in hand with their almost unique discipline, necromancy. Strange and horrifying magics that allow them to control ghosts and the souls of the deceased. They are the biggest threat to the masquerade and the Sabbat ideologies, and this is coming from a Nosferatu. In fact, they were denied access to the Camarilla and the Sabbat, making them an independent sect, which the Giovanni are quite happy with. They don't want members of the other clans meddling with their financial affairs, dragging them into the monotonous Jihad. Similar to that of the Tremere, they are a clan that should not exist. They are usurpers of blood, who did a pretty fine job obliterating their parent clan, Clan Cappadocian, or Cappadocian as it's more commonly known, out of existence. Almost. As small pockets of these peaceful, naive scholars of death still exist. It is unlikely a neonate such as yourself would have heard of the Cappadocians, as most of which did not see the outcomes of the Convention of Fawns. In fact, most were destroyed before it was even a fort to unite the clans together to better aid in their survival, with the Giovanni considered a clan proper in the 17th or 18th century, my memory fails me there. Although you may have heard of the Cappadocians and the Giovanni by a different name. Clan Hakata, which is a relatively new concept, I'm told, one that unites all the clans and bloodlines of death for reasons not totally known to me. Beyond, they are a heavy focus of destruction on behalf of the Second Inquisition. Shameful of me to admit, perhaps, but one must understand why a kindred as old as I wish to avoid those who will happily bugger you both in life and death. Proper. I will make an effort over the coming year to try and collect knowledge regarding the formation of Hakata, so I can provide you with the most accurate representation of them I can, unlike other Canite scholars and educators who are far too eager to spread information that hasn't been set in stone by those who are far more wise and patient to wait it out. In short, I shan't ramble too much about this for now. Instead, let us talk about what I do know, which is about the rise and falls of the Clan of Death, both old and not so old. We begin the discussion proper in a similar fashion to what I have done with the other clans, which involves talking about their antediluvian, an individual known as Cappadocius, although some scholars would have you believe that his name is Ashur. Others say that Ashur is the name of Cappadocius's sire, although no second generation canite exists in any myth or record that I have seen. Most agree that his sire is Erad. That said, I do grow curious about the origins of Ashur, which is certainly more fitting of a name for the time in which he was a mortal. Is it an alias the Canite conjured himself? Unlikely, as at no time has anyone heard Cappadocius himself make use of that name, it has always been ascribed to him in writing by others. It is also worth noting that some credit a vampire by the name of Ashur with the creation of the depraved Barley. One can consider that Cappadocians and Barley cousins who share the same grandfather. Or do their bonds run closer still? Hmm. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. I, I got a little sidetracked there. <laughs> Where was I? Ah, yes. In his days as a mortal priest and man of faith, Cappadocius had his own dealings with the dead, as one might expect for a priest. He would converse here and there with spirits of those gone, no doubt made many an enemy. When the antediluvian died briefly during the embrace, it is said those spirits who were waiting for him in the lands beneath, the abyss, the void, whatever you want to call it, they attempted to cling to him to prevent him from returning to his body when the curse of Cain took hold. It is said, to some extent, they succeeded as Cappadocius never returned from the underworld. Not fully at least, for large chunks of his knowledge and self-awareness were lost in that broken embrace, and the Cappadocius who returned was not the one who was kind moments prior. The soul of Cappadocius had been fragmented, and that is why he harboured such a fascination for the dead. 
Even when himself did not realize it, he was constantly seeking missing portions of himself. It could be for this reason why members of the clan all look like walking corpses, with fresh grave robbers looking just as dead at their embrace, perhaps with darkened hair and intense bags round the eyes, only to look more petrified as time marches on. Cappadocius was embraced in the first city by a member of the second generation, presumably Erad, for his intellect and obsessive interest regarding death, or more specifically, the point of it, what the reason was, when was the exact moment when the soul would leave the body, and how and what caused the body to die. Was it even the body that died, or was it the heart or mind? He believed that when a person dies, the soul leaves the body, but an echo of the soul remains. This echo, along with the flesh of the dead, can be manipulated in many ways. He and the rest of the kindred he would embrace would do this through the use of mortis, a form of blood magic dealing with corpses and their conditions after death. Think of it as a raw prototype of necromancy. Mortis, like the Tremere discipline formaturgy, or blood sorcery as the fledglings call it, is separated into different paths and contains various different rituals. Cappadocius was a very different sort of third generation Cainite, beyond his infatuation with the afterlife and death preceding it. He would make no effort to partake in the ongoing conflicts that his cousins would partake in. He would study alone for years before realizing that he would be unable to find the answers to his many questions by remaining in the second city and on his own. He would often wander and travel around the world, embracing a small handful of chowder, including Caius Cone, who would later be killed by his brother Lazarus, in addition to Jephef Cappadocius, to rule in his stead as Cappadocius went in and out of torpor, having the wildest of visions through all specs. The Antediluvian was a visionary, not a manager. He would make next to no effort in ruling his clan, only asking them to pursue the answers to the question of death. His free childer would have child of their own in positions of power, most notably Lamie, the founder of the bloodline of the same name, few of which were not following the scholarly pursuit of death and following the road of bones or heaven, two of the many paths of enlightenment, those two in particular being used primarily by members of Clan Cappadocian. Following a vision, Cappadocius would learn of this and became incredibly angry, livid, you might say, like anyone who has woken up hungry knowing that your children were no longer holy men or women and they have been misbehaving. Failing to follow the one task that Cappadocius gave to his descendants, he prepared a massive purge of his own clan. He would summon the clan at Kalmaki, an underground mountainous city in Turkey, previously as Cappadocia, to ask his descendants had they been studying death and had they been following the road of bones or heaven, amongst other questions, with Jephef and Caius in attendance. The ones who answered incorrectly were abandoned in the tunnels while the remainder continued along with Cappadocius. In the end, Cappadocia sealed thousands of vampires in the caves through the means of a powerful ward, making sure that no canine would ever leave the city once they had passed through the one side. Those who were trapped obviously starved, frenzied, fed, and fell into torpor. And with the added physical resistance of fortitude on their side, you could imagine it take a tad longer than most kindred to beat each other down. It is a beautifully simple punishment, isn't it? It even had an ingenious name. The Feast of Folly. Delicious. Crash jokes aside, many died, while some would starve and take on a more grotesque and angry visage that would be an extension of the Cappadocians. They would become the Harbingers of Skulls, who, like the Lamiae, shall be discussed in greater detail on another night. This was no doubt a remarkable tragedy to the clan and would result in their numbers to completely plummet. Naturally, there were many members of the Cappadocians who weren't too happy about this great purge. Cappadocius had clearly lost the plot, wanting to revolve the clan by eventually diabolizing God. Oh, and I don't mean Cain, by the way. I meant the G-Man himself. Yes, Cappadocius would become quite the Fruit Loop. The clan knew this, especially one of Cappadocius's future childer, an Augustus Giovanni, who was able to push the discipline of Mortis further. Mortis would allow one to animate corpses, inflict diseases and putrefications, even resulting in some to completely dissolve into ash and soot, in addition to other horrible putrefications, but Augustus and his family could drive death before them. They could reach into the shroud, the abyss, and command spirits directly, a skill that would be soon to be known as necromancy. This is when they were mortals, may I add which made him a valuable and final piece to Cappadocius' grand plan. 
Augustus and his family knew of vampires, with records of their ancestors to prove it, such as the Javanians of ancient Greece, for example. Other clans knew of Augustus, and he knew of them. He was, and still is in fact, a merchant, a businessman, somehow working up a full-scale business war for the right of his immortality. He was not interested in the political venture in Toreador, but the offer from the Cappadocians were far more enticing. What was offered to him was to become one of the most powerful canines on the planet, a Methuselah, embraced by an antediluvian. Augustus was taken to Cappadocius, being told the stories of who and what he would become, and then they would embrace him in the year 1005. It is said that a ceremony was held for the occasion, one that was probably a disguise of the Cappadocian's fear of potential full-on diablerie, be it deliberate or accidental. Cappadocius drained Augustus and bled into a vessel. The vessel was passed on to his child Jepeth, who fed it to Augustus. I have heard that there is even more distrust, as some of the blood is allegedly still in this vessel, being stored in some secret deposit. It is said that the blood connects both Antediluvian and Methuselah, so if either one of them should cock up, they had the means of taking action upon either of them. This would be known as the true vessel, and is said to have a curse placed over it as well, which is also the origins of the Giovanni curse, allegedly. Their curse is that when they bite and feed upon a victim, the kind feels an immense amount of pain, rather than the near orgasmic sensation the rest of us deliver. Why the pain wasn't the other way round, I'm not sure. Perhaps it is some poetic stance to let mortals feel the pain that the Cappadocians felt from their betrayal. Some would suggest it was actually a curse created by Lamia herself, which was passed down to Giovanni when she would later be diabolized by the Giovanni. It seems terribly simple and perfectly acceptable for a kindred to do. Embracing someone, I mean. Three words that would define a standard kindred practice that would forever change the face of the Cappadocians. Augustus Giovanni immediately began embracing his own family, becoming something between a bloodline and a cult within the Cappadocian clan, whilst maintaining themselves separate from the parent clan. They claim that it's because Augustus had planned to usurp his sire from before he was embraced, which does not surprise me in the slightest. It was either for complete power or as a means to prevent the Cappadocians purging the clan before they could purge the Giovannis and to the rest of the Necromancers. In 1444, these plans came to light as Augustus' child, Claudius, formed a conspiracy for daddykins. He would diabolize Jepef, the most beloved of Cappadocius' childer, with the aid of rich aristocrats from the other clans, especially a venture called Jadvika Alamanoff a distraction referred to as the Conspiracy of Isaac. Both sought to deceive the other. Jadviga did not reveal that she acted on behalf of a council of her clan's elders, and Claudius withheld that his sire was Augustus and his own plans for the conspiracy and that he intended to diabolize not a Jephef, but the Cappadocian founder, Cappadocius himself. While successful as the Giovanni were creating their new antediluvian, the founders of the Camarilla had learned of a plot against the Cappadocians and hoped to extinguish this threat in order to gain the allegiance of the Clan of Death for their sect. Hardestak's actions were sanctioned by the same council that had tasked Jatvega, as the Venju hoped to be victorious in either outcome, which they were. Sort of. Yes, they ceased the Giovanni's crimes, but not for long, as they were allowed to carry on their barbaric practices within their own clan and the subsequent bloodlines as part of a promise. I will elaborate on this promise later. With the Sabbat and the Camarilla ignoring the Giovanni, they were able to expand their family empire, calling Venice their family home. They learned more about the world, growing the members organically. They are essentially a very large monstrous ghoul family, not as outward as, say, the Bratovich of Clan Zemitsi, but in an inward sort of way, one that is far more subtle. They groom their children, teaching them about the family business, which doesn't mean they embrace all of them. Only the cream of the crop receives the proxy kiss, which is both ritual and power game. It makes a Giovanni. They are now aware that they are part of a family of vampires and the rewards that await good service. At the same time, it more thoroughly binds the ghoul to the family through the enforced loyalty of the blood bond and are rewarded for good service. The embrace itself is referred to in Giovanni households as the last night, which is essentially one large party before becoming a Giovanni proper. I of course have not been witness to one, nor do I know anyone who could possibly clarify what happens, 
but I can imagine these parties would be celebratory affairs like no other. Enough food to feed an army, enough whores to last you a lifetime, and enough cocaine to overdose a county. Anyway, if you want something that you haven't tried before, the last night is the night to do it. Calling it a night can be misleading, as it can last a week or be cut short should you overdose from all that cocaine, for example. The one who decides who receives the proxy kiss and the last night are the Anzaneo, which is their term, their title, for elder, which I'm told is a safe way to go if you don't know who exactly you're talking to. Some have the title of Maestro, which is a master of a continent and reports back to Venice, taking the blame or credit for things that go right or wrong. Other important members may be called Don, but because of the work of Hollywood has done to bastardise the name of Don and the Italian Mafia, the title is not so used as much as it once was, and it's rarely adopted by younger Giovanni families as well. Some of the eldest members of a family are called Nonno, meaning grandparents. They often have the most power unless they are any Anzaneo about. And most families are checked on by a capo, who checks in with the households to make sure things are running as they should be and give orders. And they answer to a padrone. And how many families are there within Clan Giovanni, you ask? A lot. Most of them very minor, such as the Rosalini and Dondolo, who have all been married into the Giovanni bloodline over time. Some have fizzled out of existence, while some exist in small pockets of society. There are three large families that are very active in the modern night, that throw a lot of power around. This being said, they don't have as much power as the aforementioned elder title of Anzaneo, or the Giovanni clan bloodline family thing proper. The oldest of these families are the Pisanobs, who origins date back to the 16th century when the Giovanni discovered the Aztecs, uncovering a large structured necromantic tradition. The Giovanni would support the locals and the devote Christian Spaniards from wiping them out. In more recent years, I believe that they are a losing end of a conflict with the Harbingers of Skulls, the poor bastards. Following them are the Dunsens, a Scottish bloodline who come into unlife in the 1700s. The Giovannis were trying to invest in the New World, but the Dunsons would block them at every turn. The Dunsons held a controlling interest in a number of shipping ventures you see. Augustus was said to be intrigued and impressed by their efforts and introduced them to the family. The Dunsons would become the largest source of financial income for the family, as well as being the largest family of cannibals. Oh, and this isn't like the Nagarajo who are forced to consume flesh. This is all voluntary. I'm not joking, so you can raise your jaw again, or, or do I need to help you push it back up, Neonate? They have been practicing this way before they were gourd, so they are a rather tasteless bunch. Pardon the pun. One can presume through them that Giovanni was able to explore and invest in the Americas, as I previously suggested, where they would embrace the milliners during the 1950s. The milliners are the Giovanni's main source of income, and they are extremely effective at it, which I am a testimony of. I have to admit that I've never been terribly versed in the ways of the Giovanni, so I've always tried to keep my distance. I encountered one during a business meeting where I accidentally stepped on his foot. Now, as I said, I knew not of their reputation to holding grudges, and he conned me out of money for years to come. Oh, don't worry. He won't be bothering us any time soon. If you catch my drift. But I digress. The milliners hold financial and criminal power over the Camarilla and the Sabbat in the US of A, working as fixers and activists for hire to distract folks from the real problems. They invest in privatised prisons that bring in a constant source of income and cheap labour, whilst also providing positions of power for the family to slip in and feed on prisoners when their secret is at risk. This isn't too hard, as Giovanni's practice the dominate discipline. Some can hit back with potence if push comes to shove, while some still carry the fortitude discipline from their Cappadocian progenitors. To my knowledge, the Giovanni control Boston, which the Camarilla allow for some reason. The Giovanni have never been a popular clan. They are cruel, manipulative and vicious, even before the Diabolary of Cappadocius, and it bleeds out into everything else they do. They are good at it though, so I suppose one can merit them in that. Effective Giovanni are sadistic Giovanni, who are far more used to you dead than you are living. Or unliving, you know what I mean. To control wraiths, ghosts, spirits, means one must acquire a fine control over a variety of psychological levers of the subject and then ruthlessly manipulating those tools to make it follow your commands. The outer shell of the Giovanni clan, the public face is less visibly cruel and horrid, but only because they are explicitly tasked to deal with the outside world to negotiate business. 
The sadism and weirdness of Giovanni's internal culture is enhanced by its incestuous nature. Giovanni can spend the majority of their lives interacting with nobody except other Giovanni, and the resulting insularity breeds additional problems. The Giovanni are arrogant and prone to underestimating the world around them in a whole manner of ways. They also underestimate the patience and wrath of the Camarilla. But they can't, I hear you think. What about the promise the Camarilla you mentioned, you add? I'm glad you remembered. The promise I spoke about before was called the Promise of 1528, a treaty between the Camarilla and the Giovanni that formally accepted the Giovanni as the successors of the Cappadocians. The promise included the assurance of non-interference of both Giovanni and Camarilla into each other's affairs. It is also granted the Giovanni authority over the city of Venice, although the Inner Circle claimed the right to hold their annual meetings there. However, rumours have begun to circulate during the last decade that the promise had a 500 year time limit, placing the moment worryingly close to its presumable end in 2028. I don't think we need to worry about this being true or not. Many will use this as an opportunity to purge the false clan of death from existence, which I believe has already begun, forcing the clans of death to form an uncomfortable family reunion. Do I believe that they will survive the next decade? I highly doubt it. In fact, I hope they don't. To be kept updated, follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we will upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.